Hello and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining the Red Rock Small Area Transportation Study Virtual Public Open House meeting number two. My name is Brian Snyder. I am a senior transportation planner with Michael Baker International. We are a engineering and architecture consulting firm working with Pinnell County on this small area transportation study. I'm accompanied by my colleague, Kevin Kugler, who's the director of planning at Michael Baker International Phoenix, Arizona office. And as well as we have a few representatives from Pinnell County Public Works. We have Tara Harmon, uh, who's the project manager, as well as Ray Tellez, who's the public information officer as well. Before we go into the presentation, I would like to just give you a few housekeeping items on how to navigate the Zoom interface, because it will be very important once we get to the conclusion of the presentation. So on this slide before you, you see the interface or something similar to the interface you're seeing on your computer screen. There's a few functions you're going to need to or may need to use throughout the course of the, the meeting tonight. Um, you're able to view the other present the other participants by click participant buttons on the lower uh, toolbar of your screen, as well as uh, the main and most important item is to open and use the chat function. So on the screen or on the uh, on the bottom of your screen in the middle of there, there's a chat symbol. Uh, if you click on that, you will, it looks like we already yep. have some people yep. testing out the chat, the, the, the chat function. Hi, Jace. Um, once we get to the questions and answer sec a portion of the, the meeting, we're actually going to ask you guys to ask your questions through that chat function, and then we'll answer your questions verbally, okay, one at a time. And then once the meeting concludes, if you stay all the way through, um, you just hit the, the end button to end the meeting. And um, that's the, the housekeeping items and how to use the Zoom interface. So what we're going to cover today is it's a pretty short in short order. We're going to try and keep this presentation around 20 minutes and we're going to cover cover about six items. We're going to briefly give you a, an overview of the study consisting of what is the Red Rock Small Area Transportation Study Area and what are some of those characteristics of the area as well as what is the study process? What's happened? Where are we going? And really what are the core objectives of the study before we get into really the most important part of this presentation, which is presenting you guys the information and the analysis that we've come up with on three key areas. And the first is being the secondary access roadway analysis and alternatives. And then we'll follow that by uh, talking through the proposed and future roadway network and functional classification system and then uh, follow on to the bicycle and pedestrian facility recommendations, which includes both on and off street facilities. So on street includes sidewalks and bike lanes, whereas off street includes trails and multi-use paths that fall outside of um, your typical roadway cross section. And then we'll close with um, an update, if you will, on the I-10 Red Rock traffic interchange modernization. And then the meeting will we'll go into to questions and answers. We'll allow you guys to uh, ask us any questions on items two through five, and then we'll close the meeting with just kind of the next steps and where we're going. So this map before you shows the Red Rock Small Area Transportation Study Area. It's outlined in that thick black line. It's approximately 36, 38 mi uh, square miles in size. Its northern boundary follows the Piaggio State Peak boundary until it crosses over I-10 and then follows the Park Link Drive alignment until it, it, it crosses the CAP uh, Central Arizona Project Canal on the east side. And then down, uh, down south, it follows that canal alignment to the Pinal Pima County boundary. And then the west, uh, uh, the west boundary of the study area is the Rice Road alignment. Okay, and some of the more notable features in here you guys are all aware of um are the the red rock community itself the master plan community as well as the union pacific railroad and pinnell air park and silver bell heliport those are some of the more notable built features within the study area as well as the cap canal and then some of the more notable natural features are the santa cruz river and the riparian areas adjacent to it as well as the ironwood national monument forest uh, in the southwest corner of the study area. 
And currently, as of 2020, there were approximately 3,600 people who lived in the entire study area within about 1,200 homes. And that's predominantly located in the Red Rock Master Plan community. Um, and, and really that, that, that is going to grow here in the, in the upcoming future. And there's already approved master plan to, in, to expand the master plan community into three more villages. And we'll, we'll get into that later in the presentation. So some of the, the, the process and objectives that we've kind of gone through is that the, the study has been broken out into kind of four different phases, but I wanna to touch on the objectives first is the, the, the objectives of the study were to kind of review and assess what's going on in the study area now, where has it been, where is it going, and then look at the projected conditions of the study. So what is the projected future land uses? What, what is the fabric of the land going to be made up in the future or what we're projecting it to be? What is the population projecting to be? What is the employment growth going to be? What are the travel patterns and what is the traffic volumes going to be in the future? Those are all things that we took into consideration and we assessed as we developed recommendations. And so all of that was kind of encapsulated in working paper number one, which is the existing and future conditions report, which is uploaded on the project website, which you all have access to, which is where you found this Zoom meeting. Um, and you can see on the, the graph before you and working paper for one, some of the things we covered, we looked at what are some preliminary options for secondary access roadway options. We looked at the existing and future conditions report. We did an analysis of the Red Rock traffic interchange. And then we looked at an in, or we inventoried what are the existing multimodal facilities. So what are the trails, sidewalks and bike lanes and crossings looking like today? And how can we improve upon those? So those are really kind of the objectives of the study is to assess the existing condition, what are some of the de deficiencies and how we can improve on it based on providing secondary access options within the study area, looking at other future roadway networks, and then um, look at as well as the multimodal facility improvements. Starting first, the secondary access roadway analysis and alternatives, we, we looked at five different options for secondary access. So one of, the, one of the reasons why this study came into fruition is because there's limited mobility within the study area, as well as outside of the study area. So for those who live within the study area, it's, it's very difficult for, for, for motorists to, to get from point A to point B. They have to take very out of, out of direct routes to get where they need to go. So the uh, uh, Interstate 10 acts uh, as the main line for both local and regional trips, whereas an interstate like Interstate 10 should really primarily be focusing on regional trips. However, given the existing roadway network, it really serves both local and regional trips. And for people living in the Red Rock Master Plan community, there's really only one place, one way to get to I-10, as well as Camino Adelante, which is the I-10 frontage road on the east side there. And that's at the Red Rock interchange. You cannot get, unless you take uh, some of the four by four off uh, the four by four trails, there's no way to get to the interstate or Camino Adelante if the Red Rock interchange is for some reason closed for an accident or other natural disaster. So that's why we looked at secondary access options. We need other ways for motorists in the event of an emergency or just provide more mobility in general, we need to provide secondary access options. So the, the, all of that being said, we looked at an array of options and these five options before you are the ones that surfaced through the initial phase of the study and that we studied and trying to come up with a preferred. So we've got five options, option A through E. So option A is illustrated in, in purple. And this is the longest route. It's 7.4 miles long and it traverses from Baumgartner Road to the north and then follows kind of the Santa Cruz River, uh, River on the east side to connect with Trico Road south of uh, Pinal Air Park, okay? And that's the longest of them all. The second option B is 5.1 miles long. And this one meanders the study area starting at Sasco Road along the Experiment, Experiment Station roadway alignment and then follows the University of Arizona Agricultural Center. 
on the north boundary and then connects to Pinal Airport Drive um, through other planned roadway efforts, okay? And then you have option C, which is in like the teal color, which this follows I-10 on the west side of the roadway. And this would take, this would take the face of a more traditional frontage road on the interstate. Um, it would connect with the, with the traffic interchange at Red Rock and then connect down with Pinal Air Park Road um, just by the park uh, interchange there. And then we have option D, which is in like the lighter or a lighter orange or salmon color. Now this one, as you can see on the inset map on the right hand of the screen, see if I can get my cursor, both options D and E have the same northern terminus or starting point. Now this is off of the, the planned Geary extension. So these dotted lines you see on the, the smaller map before you are the approved roadway network, local roadway network for the, the incoming villages that you guys may or may not be aware of that are all coming. I'm sure you guys see the construction taking place in there. So those are the roadway network. So options P e and E start at the Geary extension and eventually connect with Pinal Air Park as you said, two different locations. Option connects at the Trico Olympic as it works its way south, whereas option E connects closer to the interchange and kind of follows just outside of that I-10 out right of way back, okay? Uh, and some other things on this map, just to kind of acquaint you, uh, for those who are, are not familiar with it, we, the, the, red, the red line work on the map shows the, the planned or future Interstate 11 alignment. Um, and that's something that's been going on. I'm sure as residents of this area, you're aware of the process. I know there's been adequate public outreach for that process, but essentially there, um, what the preferred alternative is at this point in ADOT is the, the alignment is either going to be on its own alignment here along the Santa Cruz River, or the interstate is going to co-locate with I-10 and then connect here um, and then have its own alignment going west of Piacho Peak. We had these five secondary access roadway options and we had to develop a process to measure them. Which, how do we arrive at which one's preferred? So we're actually looking, we looked at seven evaluation criteria to measure the performance of them. And that's what's on the slide before you. The, the first being, and, and we use both a qualitative and quantitative approach to this. So the quantitative used tangible metrics to assign a, a value that would measure the how the roadway would perform and how it would meet the needs of the community. Whereas the qualitative approach used a um, kind of a human, a human eye on measuring what the effects and the benefit would be for that option. So the first one being construction costs would be a quantitative evaluation criteria. And that's essentially we came up with a planning level cost estimate to determine how much it would cost to construct each one of those secondary access roadway options. The second is right-of-way impacts. And the right-of-way impacts is similar to construction costs, is how much land is required for the governing body to purchase in order to build that roadway. And then the, the, the third one is physical and natural features. Now this is the first qualitative evaluation criteria where we conducted a very elaborate in-depth <clears throat> strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, or otherwise known as a SWOT analysis to kind of measure this. And we looked at what are the physical barriers? What are some of the natural barriers to implementing any of those said five secondary access roadway options? And we measured those. And same with access and connectivity. How, did, how would a roadway create a more connected network, as well as provide better access to those living within the study area. And then the, the, the fifth being land use integration. We looked at both the existing land use and the future land use, and we looked at all five options and how well did any of those options integrate and support the existing and future land uses. And then the, the, the sixth option or the fixed criteria is travel time. Just how long would it take for a motorist to traverse the corridor, right? We wanna provide secondary access, but we also want it to be in a direct route. So we looked at how long it would take for a motorist to get from point A to point B using that route. And then last but certainly not 
is stakeholder and public support. And that's why we're here today is part of this is to educate you guys on what we presented and what we've come up with and how we've measured it, how you guys, um, how, how well supported each one of those alternatives are uh, by the public's opinion. And I'll get a little bit more into that later in the presentation. So this is the result of the evaluation put them through a prioritization model. And as you can kind of see, we measure them on a numerical scale from one through five, based on each of different evaluation criteria. So on the top of that table on the screen, you have your, your five options and your secondary access road, your secondary roadway access options, options A through E. And then on the left-hand side, you have your seven evaluation criteria, construction costs, right-of-way impacts, natural and physical feature impacts, access and activity, land use integration, travel time, and stakeholder and public support. So you'll see the stakeholder and public support is zero right now because we haven't collected that data. And then you can see the cost for each of the alternatives, as well as the right-of-way impacts in acres, and then the qualitative score for the three qualitative evaluation criteria. Now, one is the lowest score would, would show that it, that alternative provided no positive impact or value. So by example, option A, is the most expensive to build, whereas option D is the least expensive to build. So option A received a score of one, whereas option D received a score of five. Okay, and that same methodology was applied across all other six evaluation criteria based on those results. And the final score is option D had the, received the most amount of points of, at 28 points with option A receiving the least amount of points at eight. Okay, and option D, E, excuse me, was in a close second at 25 points, option C at 21 points, option B at 14 points. And so that's the results of the, the evaluation criteria and how they're measured. Now we are taking into consideration what the public and our, our project stakeholders, how they view these, and we're going to integrate that results into these final results before we select a preferred option. So moving on to the roadway network and functional classification, I don't want to spend too much time here because we've got a lot more to cover, but I wanted to just quickly educate everybody on the call on really what is functional classification. And the graphic on the slide does a great job of showcasing that. Functional classification is a hierarchy of types of roads, and roads provide two main functions. They provide movement and access, okay? And the hierarchy of roads include interstates, freeways, principal arterials, minor arterials, collector roads, and locals. So you can think as 10 or Interstate 10 as having the highest level of movement for cars, but the least amount of access. Conversely, your local roads where you live off of, they have the opposite. They have the most amount of access, driveways, but they have the least amount of movement. They carry the fewest amount of vehicles. So those are the, the, the classifications that transportation planners like myself and civil engineers this is how we categorize roads based on their intended purpose and how they're supposed to serve the community. And that's something that carries down from federal regulations. And then municipalities and counties have their own functional classifications that they can tie into theirs. And Pinal County has a few other ones that they include like low density local and paved all weather public access. With that being said, I wanted to, provide what is the current roadway network and functional classification before we show you what's being proposed. It's really important to understand where we are now before what's being proposed. And the current functional classification system as it was in the start of the study is you have Parkland Drive as a parkway, which is in the form of a principal arterial. And then you have, uh, or likes of a principal arterial, you have Pecan Road as a principal arterial. You have Sasco Road as a minor arterial. Canal Air Park as a principal arterial. And then you have Baumgartner showcasing a dash line because as part of uh, Pinal County's long range planning process, Baumgartner and Park Lane Drive have been identified as a route of regional significance. So this is a planned roadway and connection to, to provide regional mobility throughout the county. Um, and then you have the, the collector's roads highlighted in blue on this map. So, Based on our analysis under working paper one, we determined that we looked at roadway and volume 25th, determined 
is that the current roadway network could support traffic volumes for to 2050. And so we didn't need to address any capacity reasons. We didn't need to win any roads. So, and what we determined is we need to provide a roadway network that would the future land use plan. And that's what's on the map here is a future land use plan. So this isn't tied to any sort of planning horizon year. And what I mean by that is this is not what we think will, how the study area will look in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or even beyond. This is just what the ultimate built out condition could look like. And this is what land use planners and transportation planners perceive the area would look like upon build out. And this is la uh, land use derived from Maricopa Association of Governments. And what it's showing is that, that it's predominantly planned or projected to be residential. And that's what's in yellow, single family residential with a, a, a lot of employment opportunities south of Red Rock and north of Pinal Air Park with nodes of multifamily and commercial uh, land uses. We're really not taking too much of a different um, a different shape as it is today. It's primarily residential. There's not a lot of commercial today. So based on the, what the future land use plan would need, we've come up with a future roadway network. So this roadway network is to meet the needs of that future land use plan, not the needs of the study area 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or 25 years from now to support that future land use plan. And through that, we have a total of 106 miles of roadways on that hierarchy of functional classification. So we've got 5.1 miles of parkway. We've got 11.6 miles of principal arterials. We've got 45.7 miles of minor arterials. We've got 9.8 miles of major collectors, 19 miles of minor collectors, and then 14.8 miles of local roads. So you and we, as part of the scope of the study is we, we were only looking at arterial and collector roadway networks. However, we did have the planning efforts from the, the, the new villages of upcoming village in the Red Rock area. So we included those in our calculations here. And that's what those 14 miles are. Those are isolated to the Red Rock community itself. Um, but what you can really see here is you see a network of arterial roadways that fall um, on your section lines while your collector roadways fall on your half section line. So your arterial, arterial roadway networks are about a mile apart. And then you have a collector roadway at that half mile. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of activity around where the employment would be south of Red Rock, as well as some of the future development up here, which would be adjacent to the upcoming or planned Interstate 11. Now we took a similar approach with our bicycle and pedestrian facility recommendations. So we, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we, we came up with a series of both on and off street recommendations. The on street are your sidewalks, your bike lanes, whereas your off street are your facilities that fall off the street, just like the name says. So this slide is the current on and off street bicycle and pedestrian facilities. We, to, to understand what we could recommend, we had to understand what was there today. So there's not a lot today, um, there's a few trails, uh, planned trails, as you see on the map here, that follow the CIP Canal, as well as the Santa Cruz River Basin. And then there's a multi-use path along the Sasco Road. And then there's a great little network of, of paved off-street facilities that connect some of those pocket parts within the community, the Red Off community. And then there's some, uh, obviously, some detached sidewalks within the community. However, outside of Red Rock, there's really not much bicycle and pedestrian facilities. So with that, we, we have developed a series of recommendations for both on and off street facilities. And these really mirror the future roadway network. And that, that's why it's important to develop those first. And then we look here. So where you see as a result, you have 212 miles of new sidewalks, 182 miles of bike lanes, eight miles of new paved paths, and 19 miles of unpaved paths or trails. Okay, and so the, 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 the facilities with sidewalks are the lines that are highlighted in yellow. So you can see all of the, the, the new roadways would have sidewalks as well as the, the, the lines that have 
a, a yellow highlight as well as a green highlight, those ones would have bike lanes and sidewalks. So those are your collector and arterial, arterial roadways. And then on top of that, your off-street facilities includes your multi-use paths, both paved and unpaved. Your paved facilities are in blue, whereas your unpaved are in brown. So with that being said, you see a proposed trail along the canal here, as well as along the, the canal here, there's art that ties into the existing trail and then a, another proposed trail that would then tie into that existing trail into the Red Rock community, as well as the planned school here. And then we have a paved trail through the green belt that's going through uh, village, village C here, <clears throat> as well as an extension of the uh, paved multi-use path along Sasco Road. And as you can see on the map on the right-hand side, that would connect to a greater trail network along the Santa Cruz River Basin. So for those adventurous type that would like to take a long bike ride or really long hikes or those ultra marathons, this would give you that access to have that, that ability to have that extreme recreation or long distance recreation. As part of the study, we also looked at the I-10 and Red Rock traffic interchange. And, and it's, it's, it's really well illustrated in working paper one on the project website. But essentially what we determined is that there's a lot of issues or deficiencies with the current design of that interchange. For those who navigate that interchange on a daily basis, I'm sure you're aware of it. You feel it when you get on and off I-10 at Red Rock. The, the very... Um, sharp curves, the, the, the poor horizontal curves, they, just, they don't meet desired ADOT design classifications or requirements. And it's been a, just a constant challenge for ADOT to maintain that interchange. And there's just uh, the circuitous nature of the ramp is just not conducive for, for for desirable traffic flow on and off of the interstate. So as part of the as part of this process, we are looking at how we can modernize the, the interchange to meet the needs of and foster the growth that's coming or could be coming here in the Red Rock area. So kind of don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's essentially a phased approach or plan in place to modernize the, the interchange. Okay. And it's kind of highlighted highlighted here on the, on the map. Um, the, the, the first phase would include an extension of Sasco Road here where Sasco Road has that really awkward turn here. The first phase would bring that in and then and as well as eliminate the existing ramps, which is on three. And then that extension of Sasco Road would then tie into the, the new ramps, which is illustrated in green here or that number two is. Those, oops, Excuse me. Those would be the new on and off ramps. And then, so that would be your interim condition. And then the, the, the following items, the ultimate condition would be for, for the Sasco Road alignment to actually tie into a new overpass that would go over I-10 and the Union Pacific Railroad on the east side of I-10 and then provide that east-west access to the rest of the study area here. And that's that's far out beyond the uh and that's far out from now, but there is interim phasing in place to improve this interchange. And I wanted to, to let you all know that ADOT is working with Sunbelt Holdings on developing this, but there is no funding in place to implement this Red Rock modernization at this time. So next steps, um, we're, we, we have a live survey and I'll get to that into a second. And we would like you all and encourage you all to participate that. That'll give us the feedback we need to, um, that we need to fill out the remainder of that evaluation criteria. And then once we take all the input we receive through our stakeholder and public outreach coordination, we're then gonna start drafting a final report. And that draft final report is going to be a combination of what you what what's in working paper two and what's in working paper work, working paper one and working paper two, and then we're going to go back to our project work group, which is an assembly of project stakeholders, to get their final buy-in on the draft final report. And then at that point, once we get their approval, we'll then go to the Pinal County Board of Supervisors and give them a project briefing on what was the process, what was this process like, what is the end result, 
And then once we have their approval, we'll stamp the, we'll make any necessary changes and then we'll develop the final report. Um, so today's meeting was very brief. We did a lot of work in this process and it's, they're both, they're, all of the work we've done is well documented in both working paper two and working paper one, which are both uploaded and available for download on the project website. I encourage you guys to read those. Um, and at this point, I would like to provide you an option. If you may have, you may or may not have already seen it on the project website, but there is a quick brief survey. It's only three questions long. That would be really, really helpful to us to get your feedback on the secondary access roadway options, ranking them from most preferred to least preferred on a scale of one through five, as well as giving us um, whether you're telling us whether you support the future roadway network and proposed functional classification system, as well as the bike recommended bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And there's also opportunity for you guys to open, uh, provide any open-ended comments through a comment box on that survey. Uh, you can either click the link on the slide before you on the project website or snap a, a quick photo of that QR code on the slide. So at this point, We'll open it up for for questions. Um, we're going to um, ask you guys, as I said earlier in the meeting, and for anybody that didn't that wasn't on when we first met, we're going to ask you guys to ask your questions through the chat function, which you can find at the bottom of your interface, your Zoom interface. If you click on that button, you'll see a a, a chat box pop up. Just make sure the two is to everybody and then type your question away and we'll go ahead and respond to questions as they come in verbally. Um, and we'll do that for the remainder of the meeting. Could I just ask my question verbally, is that okay? Go ahead. Yeah, I didn't see who was that speaking. Go ahead, Jace. I think I saw you. Okay. Yeah, that was me. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. So, so you mentioned that the traffic interchange is a relatively low priority because of the lack of funding, um, but the roadway to Pinal Air Park, um, am I to assume that that's a higher priority? And if so, what is the estimated timeline for getting something like that built? Is it five years, 10 years, 15 years? Do you have any estimate for that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Jace. Um, there, there is no timeline associated with those at this point. Um, the, the, the secondary access roadway has been considered a, a priority for the county, and that's the reason for the study is to reach a preferred alignment there. Um, so it is a priority. I, I wouldn't say that the interchange isn't a priority. Um, that's certainly a priority, but that's something that ADOT is working with there uh, with some bad holdings on that. Um, but from a county perspective, it's hard to determine a, a definitive timeline, but we are going to, as part of the draft final report, is we're going to look at categorizing the, the roadway, the proposed roadway networks, as well as on and off street facility recommendations and categorize them into a short, mid and long term. And usually that short term is five years, that midterm is 10 years, whereas long term is, is 20 years plus. So that work is to, is to come, but um, we don't have an exact answer on when that secondary access roadway would, be, um, would, would come to fruition at this time. And there's a lot of factors that go into that, whether it's uh, ongoing development that could put pressure on that. Um, there's certain things in play that, that, that can dictate the implementation timeline. So it looks like we have another question coming in from the chat. Yeah, Brian, I'll, I'll read it for you since you're kind of navigating here. It's this, this question comes from uh, Butch and Tricia. I see the study has been a lot of time in the Red Rock area. What about east of I-10? Why not include the population towards Cattle Tank Road down to Davis Road? So I'm not too... 
include the population towards Cattle Tank Road down to Davis Road. I guess I'll pull up a map real quick so I can get my bearings. So I I I think what he's ref what they are referring to is out here. So it, it's a good question, and and really when you when you start coming up with an area of study, it, it's it's hard to draw the line in the sand, if you will. There's a lot of factors that go into determining a study area. And quite frankly, at 38 square miles, that's a lot larger than a small, typical small area transportation study can be. They can be larger, they can be smaller, but based on the specific objectives and needs of this study that we worked with county staff on, is we looked at this, at this geography that encompassed from Rice Road to the Central Arizona Project Canal and from Piacho Peak to Pima and Pinal County boundary with a focus on connecting the Red Rock community to Pinal Air Park. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of, of activity out there that could be addressed in future studies, um, but to meet the needs and the scope of this study, we, we, we drew the west boundary at the CAP Canal. And this next question comes from someone that's using an iPad user, so no name specific. Uh, and maybe I'll help you with this question or this response. So when will construction start on the off and on ramp? And I, I'm assuming uh, this iPad user is referring to the, the Red Rock TA, uh, TI traffic interchange. And I just wanted to underscore one thing that Brian already mentioned is that it's, and, and that Jace asked the question with respect to priorities. It, we certainly weren't implying that the Red Rock, the improvements to the traffic interchange or Sasco Road or the ramps that Brian that described, we weren't characterizing them with respect to their priority, particularly from an ADOT standpoint or, or a Sunbelt standpoint for that matter. Brian's point was, especially back to Jace, was the fact that there, there's just simply no funding identified at this particular point by uh, the Arizona Department of Transportation or the Federal Highway Administration, which conventionally funds those types of improvements. So, but specifically to the iPad user uh, with their question that the timing is, as Brian pointed out, that it's a series of phases and that timing is starting now uh, with respect to the um, reservation of the right of way and construction plans, engineering designs are currently in process uh, with uh, ADOT for the, the Sasco Road, the more direct connection that Brian uh, described and shown here on the graphic, uh, number one. And, and then number two with those on-ramps and off-ramps, you're gonna see construction starting with that, uh, it, most likely within the next uh, four to 12 months, depending on how the design process goes. So. There is, there is a level of effort and priority in the near term with respect to the Sasco Road and these ramps. Uh, it's just that the traffic interchange itself, there's no funding or immediate timeline identified for those improvements. Brian, this one comes from Jane. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to study the options yet, but is one of the plans to do I-11 right down Sasco, I think of the safety. So I think what Jane is asking is, um, she hasn't had an opportunity to look at ADOT's study on the proposed alignment of I-11. And I'll, I'll pull up a map to help answer your question, Jane. Um, no, the, the, the answer to your question is no. The, it, Put it simply, ADOT uh, last November did put out a record of decision, which uh, approved their uh, stage one environmental impact statement for the right uh, alignment for I-11. As you may or may not know, they looked at a, a lot of different alignments through that. I don't know off the top of my head how many, but a lot. And the ones that came out as the preferred option um, is the one that's illustrated in, in red on the map. Now it's kind of confusing because the preferred option has two options, but based on further analysis, um, once they get through that, is they're going to determine whether I-11 would co-locate or just follow along I-10. So as you guys may travel long distances via car, many times interstates are, are co-located. So you're actually technically on two interstates, 
while on one facility. And then while, as it co-locates along I-10 from Tucson, it would have a system interchange there just north of Park Lane Drive, and then it would traverse west, north of uh, the community of Red Rock to follow its own alignment um, along here, west of Piacho Peak. The other option is entirely from Tucson, I-11 would have its own alignment going through the town of Marana and along the Santa Cruz River Basin. Um, and, and, and it would actually include a, um, and both of those options, there would be a connection here. So whether I-11 is co-located with I-10 or it follows its own alignment within your community, there's still going to be an I-10 connection here in a system interchange where that diamond is illustrated on the map. But uh, there is a, no funding and there's still a lot of analysis and study and process to go through before this is even close to implementation. Um, so I just wanna make sure we're all aware of that. Thank you for your question, Chair. Anybody else have any additional questions? Please put them in the chat room. Can I ask a follow-up question? Would that be all right? Sure, Jace. Sure, Jace. Okay, so um, you talked about interstates having very limited access and, and Red Rock essentially relying on the interstate for, for coming in and out of the community. I, I know that in the documentation that you've provided, you've measured traffic volumes, right? How many cars get on and off the freeway? How many cars enter into Red Rock on Sasco Road? But do you also have metrics or statistics that show how often fatalities happen on I-10 and how often they shut down the freeway? Because in, in our community, we have so much trouble with that. But if there's a fatality and the freeway is shut down, there is no way to access this neighborhood. There's, I mean, unless you're willing to drive your four by four through the desert. But um, I wonder if that is something that's been brought to the surface or if that's a metric that you guys could look up because it might help with prioritization and funding to know that, that there are entire days where, where access to the community is, is completely blocked. In fact, it's, it's not even a matter of being between the accident and Red Rock. If they shut down the freeway, all of those cars are routed through the Red Rock interchange and it is impassable. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're aware of those events, and that's really why uh, the county um, is, is has started this study is to to look at how we can improve the overall connectivity and possible mobility uh, within the study area. Because uh, in an event of a fatality crash, where um, a lot of time needs to be put into the investigation of that crash when the fatality or a serious injury takes place, it can shut down the entire facility. To answer your, your question specifically, we, we did look at crash data and um, actually I-10 is the, is the only facility within the study area that has, and I'll pull up a map for you here in a second, is the only facility in the study area that has a fatality. So given that uh, eight, uh, I-10 is an ADOT facility, it's, it's, it's a little bit, the, the improvements to that facility are beyond the scope of this work to address the, any safety mitigations that need to be put in place to prevent fatalities. Um, but we did take into consideration um, the, the safety metrics to help us determine well, how frequently our, our crash is happening and fatalities and how frequently is I-10 shut down. But that's that's really what, why this study is is underway. And once it's finalized, the the county will have a an approved and adopted plan that showcases options for the county to start preserving the right of way, start securing funding to implement those options that will give residents the opportunity uh, for another way in and out of the community in the event of I-10 being shut down or in the event of a natural disaster, uh, which Thankfully, we, we, are, we, we don't get a lot of those here in, in the desert, but um, it's always an, a possibility. Jace, the map that Brian is showing and describing is found in our working paper number one, just for clarification. Yeah, so this is uh, the crash severity map, uh, which showcases all the crashes within the study area, as well as accompanied by a heat map that just shows the intensity of how many crashes there are at a location. And yeah, thanks, Kevin. And we do have further crash analysis written in, up in the report. 
Okay, yeah, that's great. I, I did miss that map. And um, last question, and, and that's only as a result of, of being able to see this heat map. So our two interchanges, the Pinal Air Park interchange and, and the Red Rock interchange, are the two wackiest, weirdest, you know, most backward engineered interchanges in, in, in Pinal County, I think. Um, is there any focus on Pinal Air Park with, with its strange cloverleaf design? And, and is that something that's also slated for some kind of re-engineering or redesign, or is that, that not on the radar right now? Brian, maybe I can assist if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Jason. With and through this study, those observations uh, and with our project partners, particularly at the Air Park, Silver Bell uh, Airfield, we've had a lot of discussions and coordination with them uh, along with, uh, of course, county staff. And those, those issues and concerns uh, have been articulated and discovered, so to speak, as a formal dialogue through this study. And so uh, Pinal County does have that on their radar, particularly with respect to the economic development potential of the air park and surrounding properties of the air park and recognizing some potential roadway geometric limitations of the traffic interchange. Uh, it, it was not a singular focus of this study per se, but the good, the good news is, is that with and through this study, that dialogue is kind of commenced and the, those discussions will continue forward. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any additional questions for the chat room? Give it another minute or two. I guess that means we've satisfactorily answered your questions or uh, presented the information that you were looking for. Maybe Brian, as we're waiting, you can remind them of the, the location of the, the survey again. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, so as a reminder, and I'm actually logging in to see if we've gotten any responses during the meeting. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can get to the survey. Um, you either click the link on the screen before. <laughs> What's going on here? Um, you can either click the link what Robert was trying to do or snap a photo of um, the QR code and that'll bring you to directly to the survey and it's a very quick survey just gives you some brief information about the study followed up by three quick questions the thing ranking those five secondary access roadway options from most preferred to least preferred as well as showcasing your support for uh, whether you guys support or do not support the recommendations we have for the future roadway network and the functional classification, as well as the on and off street bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And there's an opportunity for you guys to provide open ended comments on both of those as well. Um, so yeah, looks like we have um, concluded the questionnaire. So I'll go ahead and round out. <laughs> uh, like Steven, are you able to take care of this? Um, <laughs> So I would like to just thank you guys all for your time today. Uh, I can speak for Pinal County and Michael Baker. We really appreciate your guys' time for joining us today, as well as your interest in the study. And I really wanna underscore the importance of your feedback on this because this is, will become an approved and adopted plan. And the more community and support and feedback we have just makes a stronger plan. So, um, and, and I know questions can come up after the fact, so I have Tara's information on here, as well as myself and Kevin's. If a question does come up that, um, that comes up later, feel free to send both uh, myself, Kevin, or Tara an email, and we'll happily respond to your questions uh, or reply to your questions after the meeting. And Brian, I'm putting my email in the chat. Oh. So I'm the PIO for the Public Works Department. And if you people, you know, if anyone has any more questions, we are gonna post this video. Uh, on, I believe on the ClearGov website, right, Ryan? Yes, so and thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ray, great reminder. So you guys should have gotten a notification as you entered that this this recording will be, uh, this meeting will be recorded and uploaded to the project website. And then also as a, another reminder, Ray, thank you. That survey will be live for up to two weeks. So if you can't take it now, come back and feel free to take the survey. We'll be, we'll be collecting responses for, for two weeks. 
And also just a quick note, I'll be sharing this on social media, on the public works media channels through Nextdoor, Facebook, Twitter. And folks, uh, maybe you had a neighbor, somebody who couldn't uh, you know, attend this meeting live, feel free to share this video with them or reach out to any one of us uh, if they have any more questions. Thank you, Ray. Um, and it looks like we got one final question that just came in. Um, as far as um, if there's going to be improvements on uh, Missile Base Road, if Dante or Longhorn, they're outside of the study, so we, we're not aware of any improvements um, here. But if you follow up with Ray, um, he may be more aware of some other planning or improvement efforts that are underway within the county. So feel free to reach out to Ray. He provided his, his contact information or his, his email there in the chat. Hopefully that helps Butch and, and Trisha. So again, thank you all for your time. And um, if there are no questions, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude the meeting. Just real quick, Bush and Trisha, I can I can uh, look into that for you guys. If you just send me a, an email in the chat, and I'll uh, I'll try and get back to you on that. All right. Well, again, thank you all for your time, and we're going ahead and close the meeting. Thank you.